maybe I'll get the introduction started and that'll give people a couple minutes to roll in. Great. That's okay. All right. Um, well, welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. Um, this has been our new normal for rounds this year. Um, all virtual. So I'll introduce um, Dr. Lindy Liu, one of our PGY3s, and Dr. McCauley, as most of you know. So Dr. Liu is one of our PGY3 uh, residents in the CCFPM program. She graduated medical school at the University of Ottawa in 2018 and completed her family medicine training at Western. Unfortunately, in July, Drew, uh, Lindy will be leaving us to return to Ottawa um, and start her career in emergency medicine. Congratulations at uh, Queensway Carleton Hospital and Pembroke Regional Hospital. Um, Dr. Bill McCauley, I'm sure nobody knows, is one of our eMERGE colleagues, um, and he's also the Assistant Dean of the Professional Affairs at Schulich. Um, he graduated from Doctor of Medicine program back in uh, at Schulich in uh, 1987, holy crap. He obtained his specialty certification in emergency medicine uh, from the Royal College uh, back in 1991, and also did a Master of Health Professions Education from the University of Illinois in Chicago um, in 1999. Um, he's had several administrative positions, including the program director of the emergency medicine uh, program, uh, Royal College program from 1996 to 2004, and most recently served as a medical advisor in practice assessment and enhancement at the CPSO from 2004 to 2019. His approach to helping physicians is one that he describes as physician-centered, taking an interest in the context, environment, and other contributing factors that add to the challenges of professional practice. Um, and with that, I hand it over to, for you to present your microaggressions in medicine. Thank you so much okay. for that introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lindy. Um, so the topic of this presentation is microaggressions in medicine. So, so moving on, uh, so there are no, no disclosures, um, no financial or other conflicts of interest to disclose. I would like to just start off the whole presentation with a couple of, uh, with a few cases. Um, and these are all real life cases. Um, case number one, you are a female resident assessing a patient in the emergency department and you introduced yourself to the patient as Dr. X. In the middle of your assessment, your patient answers the phone and says, um, and says to, says to the person on the other line, wait, let me call you back. I'm talking to the nurse right now. Going to case number two, uh, during a code that is run by a female senior resident, the nurse asks what medications the male junior would like to draw up, even though he is not running the code. And then case number three, you receive an email that addresses more than one physicians, uh, more than one physician in the same line, but the male physicians are Dr. X and you are the only, uh, only person with your first name as, addressed by your first name as the only female physician listed. So these are all examples of microaggressions. Um, we'll have a lot of many opportunities for discussion later, but I would like to open it up for just a brief discussion to see if there are any similar experiences from the group. Is anyone willing to, to share if they've had experienced a microaggression either through observation or um, uh, being a victim of uh, a microaggression? These are all examples of gender-based microaggressions, but as you know, there are others. I'll go if you want. It's Pete Tanaka. Thanks, Pete. Um, I mean, I, I surprisingly, well, shouldn't be surprisingly, still get uh, the occasional uh, person who will say, um, well, where are you from? Which which can be a very benign question, but to a visible minority, it's it's usually more, more uh, um, uh, based on race. And then, uh, but the most common one I've gotten recently is, uh, wow, your English is quite good. Um, where are you from is the second part. So uh, those of you who, who know me, I'm from Montreal and uh, <laughs> I, uh, born and raised here uh, as were my parents. So, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's certainly in the media a lot lately, the, uh, the anti-Asian uh, 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 microaggressions. Thanks, Pete. Uh, maybe time for one more. Is anyone else willing to share? There will be time later on uh, for, for, for more. I think we're seeing a lot of comments. 
Yeah, just just unmute yourself if you want to say something, and we can uh, and uh, we'd be happy to hear you. I can share, Dr. McCauley. It's, it's Jen here. I uh, I actually last year saw a patient who came to UH who needed a thylac repair. I actually saw the patient with Dr. Dong, and after I explained the whole procedure, the patient said, and I quote, because I remember this like it happened yesterday, she asked me if she can have someone white do the procedure. Wow, okay. Okay, thank you for, for sharing. As I said, uh, think about uh, other examples of microaggressions. Um, gonna, there's gonna be some time to, to hear a bit more about those experiences later on in the presentation. Um, we thought that um, that it would it might be helpful for us to just have a have a little primer on professionalism, or maybe I'll say that I thought it might be helpful. So, in my role as assistant dean professional affairs in my past life with, at the CPSO, I've done done a fair bit of work on professionalism, professional behavior, and and obviously this is a con topic is related to professional behavior. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about a definition of professionalism that we're going to reach by initially looking at a number of frameworks. There's not one accepted definition of professionalism that everyone can use. Most of our concepts of professionalism comes from uh, professionalism frameworks from various organizations with which we interact. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about those. Um, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about how professionalism is developed uh, because I think that's a, a really important for those of us that are supervising trainees. And then I want to talk about lapses in professional behavior and those lapses that uh, those factors that can lead to the lapses. So um, I thought I'd start with a national framework, and that's uh, from the Royal College. Um, uh, the CFPC also has uh, uh, uses CanMeds as CanMeds FM. It's slightly different, but it uh, it uh, it came from CanMeds. CanMeds started in about 1996. And uh, people may or may not know that CAMEDS was actually an offshoot of a program called FPO, which stood for Educating Future Physicians of Ontario. And FPO um, was a collaborative of the, at the time, five medical schools in Ontario, where they wanted to develop um, essentially a framework for defining what a, a generic graduating physician from a medical school should, should, should be. So when the Royal College wanted to develop their educational framework, they, uh, they borrowed heavily from FPO and developed CanMeds, which has seven specific roles. It's been um, uh, changed a couple of times. We're now on the third iteration of CanMeds. And uh, in CanMeds 2015, uh, the professional role is defined with four key competencies, and there are a number of enabling competencies below each of those. So the competencies for the professional role for Royal College specialists is to one, to demonstrate a commitment to patients. So being committed uh, by applying best practices and adhering to high ethical standards. Uh, secondly, they, they recognize the importance of our relationship with society and societal expectations. Uh, so uh, demonstrating a commitment to that and understanding that we do have expectations from society that, 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 uh, and that society has granted us some various privileges. The third is to demonstrate a commitment to our own profession by adhering to standards, both in terms of our, our uh, medical standards, practice guidelines and such, and, and by participating in physician-led regulation, not only through our regulatory uh, authorities, but through the hospitals and through uh, organizations like the Royal College. And finally, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, uh, the, that CanMeds and the Royal College recognize the importance of our own physician health and well-being, and that we are to demonstrate a commitment to ourselves and to others, uh, our colleagues, uh, uh, in order to foster optimal patient care. So, moving down to a, so sorry, sorry the um, uh, the uh, the CanMeds framework then really talks about a number of broad principles. If you think of it, they're they're very high level. So a commitment to health and well-being, um, participating in professional regulation, being committed to society and societal expectations. So all of these things are very high level. And in fact, in 2015 or 14 or so, when the Royal College was reworking CanMeds. The, the uh, provincial regulatory authorities suggested to, uh, to uh, the Royal College that perhaps the professional role should be at the center of the flower and everything else emanates from that. Um, there was a lot of robust discussion about that, but ultimately the Royal College being a collection of specialists felt that medical expertise needed to still be at the center of the flower. But uh, it was certainly something that, that generated a lot of discussion. So moving to a, pro a provincial framework, uh, I would suspect many of you don't know that this document exists. It's called the Practice Guide. Um, it was published in 2007 and hasn't been edited since that time. It's really fairly high level, so it's not a type of a document that needs to, to be edited and revised that often. 
It was developed through a multi-stakeholder consultation process, and it was meant to um, articulate our values and, and, and principles to assist us as members of the college of knowing what our duties are and what, our ration, what the rationale is for those duties. And finally, to pro provide a framework for our policies at the CPSO. So the values are very high level. Again, they are from chapter one of a medical ethics textbook, um, compassion, service, altruism, and trustworthiness are the values that are, that are thought to be important by the CPSO and members that contributed to this. And the principles and duties, the duties in particular that um, this, this document suggests that we, we need to adhere to are having duties individually to patients, and that, that makes sense. Um, uh, recognizing that we do have to uh, have duties and responsibilities to the public at large, not just to individually to patients. And finally, again, they recognize the importance of, of having duties to ourselves and duties to our colleagues. Uh, so supporting our colleagues and uh, looking after everyone's well-being. And finally, coming down to Schulich, uh, Schulich doesn't have a, a uh, policy or a framework on professionalism, but to, to, uh, to behave. Um, and the code is really, it's for learners such as medical students, residents and uh, fellows, for faculty obviously, uh, also for staff that are employed by Schulich and for visitors. So if you're a visiting professor or doing an elective from elsewhere, but you're within the Schulich family, then you're expected to adhere to this. And the, the code of conduct really uh, starts off nicely as far as I'm concerned. It talks about shaping and promoting our professional behavior. So that is a very forward moving statement. Um, but then it also says something that I'm less keen on, uh, offering direction for corrective action. So, um, uh, you know, I think that a, that a code like this, and I'm, those of you who have worked with me know that I, I'm keen on promoting professional behavior in a positive way and taking away from the, from the uh, sort of disciplinary approach to, to this. So calling something offering direction for corrective action is kind of at odds with uh, shaping and promoting professional behavior, in my opinion. So if you look at if you look at the three frameworks that I've referenced, there are a lot of common themes, um, the themes of, uh, of, of responsibility to society and the social contract, um, wellness, collegiality, uh, obviously service and duty, confidentiality, and all of these things in my mind uh, surround two main and important concepts, which are trust and respect. And and in thinking of that, that brings to mind a definition that I think works well and is quite simple for professionalism. And, and so the definition I like to use is that professionalism are the words and the actions that promote trust and respect from patients, colleagues, learners, and coworkers. So words are the things that we say, uh, the things that we write, the things that we type, um, and actions are the things that we do. And, and I would also, uh, also suggest that, that it's the things that we don't say and the things that we don't do. So if you're a bystander and observing someone who has a lapse of professional behavior that's targeted at another individual, or microaggression, for example. If you're a bystander and don't say something, then that can affect the way that someone respects you. So think of professionalism as, as the things that we say and the things that we do that promote trust and respect from patients, colleagues, learners, and coworkers. So just a couple of minutes on how professionalism is developed. I think this is an important, this is important in an academic center where we are, are role modeling all the time. And there's a publication uh, that is put out by the Alpha Omega Alpha uh, Honor Medical Society. Every five years or so, they, they um, uh, put a publication related to professionalism. And this one, it's not the last one. There's one that just came out this year uh, or yeah, you know, just, just uh, in January of this year. Um, but there's another uh, one from 2017, which is called Professionalism in the Modern Era. It's a short little manuscript, about 100 pages, 10 short chapters. And one of the chapters is on developing professionalism. And in this chapter, the authors describe that we all have an individual identity and that identity begins at birth and develops through nature and nurture and our life experiences. Um, and then professional identity is something that's separate from that. Um, and our professional develop, de identity only develops if we have to develop it. So not everyone has to develop a professional identity. But when that's developed, it's superimposed on top of a, your personal identity. And it's developed primarily through the educational paradigm uh, and primarily through two main things. So role models and mentors uh, and our clinical and non-clinical experiences. So this, this graphic is a little busy at first blush, 
Um, it was uh, this chapter was was written, by the way, by doctors Richard and Sylvia Cruz, who are um, uh, two retired professors from McGill who have been world leaders, literally, in the concept of professionalism and particularly undergrad uh, medical education. But but if you look at the center the, the, the center box with the dots outlined, that's our educational experience, and within that experience, we are socialized to the concept of professionalism. So we bring in our existing pers uh, personal identities into that educational paradigm, and then we become socialized. And we become socialized through role models and mentors um, through both conscious and unconscious ways. And so if you think about it, uh, as a learner, you might see someone that you respect and trust, um, and you uh, want to emulate that they that way they behave. And so you might consciously take some of their behaviors and try to socialize that into your behavior so that you're treating patients, colleagues, coworkers, and other learners uh, in that way that emulates your role model. Um, it's a little unusual, I think, to, uh, to consciously want to um, take negative behaviors and, and, and socialize that into your experience, but it is not uncommon for an unconscious acquisition of that. So if someone is being disruptive uh, and getting their way, uh, you will see that and you'll see that, uh, that that sort of behavior, which most of us would think is negative behavior, can result in uh, positive gains for an individual. And you might unconsciously recognize that and you could unconsciously pull that into your socialization process, realizing that you know, the squeaky wheel does get the grease and uh, make that part of your professional identity. Similarly, our clinical and non-clinical experiences uh, influence us. So clinical experiences is our, our observations of things at the bedside and in the OR and in the emergency department. And the non-clinical experiences are really the way that we uh, observe professional interactions, typically through an educational format. So, so through rounds or, or small group learning, those sorts of things. So all of these things cause a socialization process that is then superimposed on our, our existing personal identities and spits out on the other side, your personal and professional identity. I think it really highlights the importance of role modeling more than anything in this in this slide. Um, so uh, uh, there are lapses in professional behavior. We all have lapses. Um, microaggressions are a lapse. That's why we're talking about this. Um, you'll notice I call them lapses. I'm not keen on talking about unprofessional behavior. I'm trying hard never to call anyone unprofessional. Uh, I don't like the term unprofessional or incompetent. I think that we all um, are in inherently professional and I think we all are inherently competent if we've, if we've made it through an educational process successfully. Uh, but we, have, we, we, we all sometimes struggle. So sometimes we struggle with our clinical competence and make mistakes, that doesn't make us incompetent. Sometimes we struggle with our uh, professional behavior, that doesn't make us unprofessional, it's a lapse. And so uh, I like to look at lapses in professional behavior along a spectrum. Uh, and I like to categorize them as non-major and major. So the major ones are, are pretty obvious, sexual abuse of patients, criminal acts. Uh, and then the non-major ones are, are not minor. They're, they're specifically not minor, but they wouldn't be considered major. So microaggressions is an example of one. And then things like, like just being rude or insensitive, um, being unreliable, so showing up late for your shift all the time or uh, not responding to pages, uh, being dismissive towards uh, other people um, addressing uh, your, your professional behavior with you. Uh, and then disruptiveness, which is really a pattern of, of, uh, of professionalism lapses that can lead to uh, impact patient care. And then, and then much more significant harassment, discrimination, and intimidation. So these are the types of lapses that we see, microaggressions being at one end, but they're not minor. And then there are factors. So we, we, for the most part, we are act professionally, but sometimes there are, there are lapses and those lapses take place for reasons. And, and I like to look at it as, as reasons for personal development, personal stressors, environmental stressors, and context. So personal development are basically the personality that you bring, that's your, that's your existing personal identity. Your personal stressors are things like uh, health stress. So if you've got uh, physical or, or mental health problems, uh, substance use disorders, um, you're, you're, if you're experiencing stresses in your relationships or with your family, um, with, with finances, or perhaps you've got a complaint from the college or a lawsuit against you, these are all personal stressors. Environmental stressors are, are things that take place in the workplace. Um, if you've, you've got work overload or you're burning out, and then contextual issues, which are those things that affect all of us. So pandemic, great example of that, uh, war, economy, politics. And if you look at things this way, it really reminds me of our patient-centered approach to medicine and where, where someone has a, a, a experiences an illness with a disease, 
Um, and that illness experience is going to be different depending on who the person is. So an 80 year old with asthma is going to have a different illness experience from a six year old with asthma is a classic example. And all of that takes place within a context. So an 80 year old with asthma who has got low socioeconomic status is going to have a different life experience or illness experience from an 80 year old with asthma in a high socioeconomic experience or class. So thinking about that, it really reminds me of our lapses and the factors that lead toward lapses in professional behavior. And so this little graphic demonstrates that, that we're in a context of a pandemic right now. Um, you bring your personal identities into that, and uh, maybe your personal identity is one that, um, that, that, that has you short on patients for whatever reason, I mean, patients with a CE at the end, not TS. Um, uh, maybe your workplace is, 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 is under a lot of stress right now because of financial complaints or human health resource uh, issues. Um, and maybe you've got some personal stressors uh, related to health or family. And where all of these thing, things collide, right in the center is where uh, you're likely to uh, have an increased chance of having professionalism lapses. So all of these stressors and contextual factors can increase the risk of having a, having a professionalism lapse. And when we're trying to understand why someone's experienced one of these things, it's really important to take all of these factors into account before just jumping to the conclusion, pointing the finger and saying, that person is unprofessional. So uh, I'm just going to segue back to Lindy now. Um, the, the lap spectrum is one that demonstrates a number of different behaviors that could be considered lapses in professional behavior. Microaggressions is considered non-major. It's been described as uh, death by a thousand paper cuts. And I think that that is uh, potentially a nice little metaphor for what microaggressions are. Uh, each of them might be considered minor, but as an aggregate, it can have a significant effect. Uh, so I'm going to hand it back over to Lindy now, uh, who's going to take us through some, some interesting concepts about microaggressions. Thank you, Dr. McCauley. So I'm going to go into microaggressions now. And the objectives of my part of the presentation are as follows. Number one, talking about the definitions of implicit bias and microaggressions, talk about how microaggressions occur in medicine, and discuss frameworks for addressing implicit bias and microaggressions. And I would like to open it up for, for discussion. I'm hoping to have a lively discussion between um, everybody in this group. So I'm going to start off with some definitions of implicit bias and microaggressions. So when we meet someone, we unconsciously perceive what their age, gender, or role to be, and we map their identities to other meanings. And implicit bias is the attribution of traits to a person based on the way they look and not on their personal traits and qualities. Manifest, um, microaggressions, they are the manifestations of implicit bias. You know, they are everyday modern day expressions of unconscious bias and they are everyday identity based insults or dismissals. They can happen to anyone regardless of what their gender, race or ethnicity. In terms of, oh, Bill, would you be able to go back to the previous slide? Sorry. Uh, in terms of um, the origin of the word microaggression, it's, um, it's started in 1978, and this was initially coined by um, Dr. Chester Pierce. And this was initially used to describe the phenomenon of subtle put downs of Black Americans by non-Black Americans. And in 2007, uh, Dr. Daryl Sue, he expanded the term to include women and other historically marginalized groups who experience insults or indignities as a result of their gender, racial, or sexual identity. And you might ask, you know, what is the difference between microaggression and just blatant discrimination? Now, microaggressions are typically done unknowingly by the aggressor, and they can happen in everyday life. And the word micro doesn't mean that these transgressions are insignificant. The micro in this context refers to the subtle everyday and mundane aspect of these transgressions. So why should we care about microaggressions? Now microaggressions can exert a profound physical and mental toll. Regular exposure to perceived discrimination of any kind adversely affects the psychological and physical health of the recipients aka death by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, microaggressions, they contribute to lower self-esteem. They, they have also been linked to depression, anxiety, trauma responses, burnout, and negative impact to learning and academic performance. When I was doing working on this presentation, I was sent an article um, that was written by Dr. Sandra Scott Simon, who is a ER physician, and she talks about how the cumulative effects of microaggressions impact our professional self-worth 
and it leads to the imposter syndrome commonly experienced by women in medicine. And finally, um, studies have demonstrated that perceived discrimination is associated with hypertension with the most clear effects described for black and indigenous individuals. There are various types of microaggressions. There are micro assaults, micro insults, micro invalidations, and environmental microaggressions. Now, micro assaults um, are explicit and intentional attacks intended to offend the recipient, AKA they're the old fashioned racism that's conducted on an individual or private manner that allows the perpetrator anonymity. Now, examples of this could be you know, using racial slurs or deliberately demonstrating preference for one, per one group over another. Um, and I would like to just bring about some, some real life examples of micro assaults. So in the news, um, in 20, 2017, there was a video that was released of a woman at a Mississauga walk-in clinic, and she was asking to see a white doctor for her son. In 2020, there was a video that came out of Joyce Eshaquan, and she was an indigenous woman um, who was insulted and demeaned at a Quebec hospital before dying the same day. And in 2021, there was a segment on CBC Radio's um, White Coat, Black Art, that discusses the everyday racism that's faced um, by black nurses in Canada while providing care to patients. And these are all Canadian examples of micro assaults. Micro insults, they are subtle messages that a particular group is not respected. And this is a second type of microaggression. Now, a couple examples. So this can occur when you know, women or underrepresented minority physicians, they're confused for um, the nurse, the janitor, the interpreter, or any other non-physician role because they don't fit the traditional image of a physician. Um, it could be comments suggesting that people um, attain their current position through affirmative action rather than through their abilities. It can also take in the form of a backhanded compliment as Dr. Uh, Tanaka alluded to in that this individual is, it's, um, is an exception to the stereotype. Now, um, I just wanted to um, um, allude to this article in the Washington Post that was written in 2017. It was written by Dr. Reef Pasarev and she was um, a female physician and she talked about the challenges of being young and female while working as a doctor. And I highlighted some of the, some of the things that were said to her for example, being asked what her age was, despite being an attending for several years, being called adorable, or being asked, being called sweetheart, or being asked to see a quote unquote real doctor. The third type of microaggression is um, there are comments that negate or dismiss the feelings or experiences of a recipient of a microaggression. So comments such as, you're being too sensitive, or I don't see color, or um, comments that perpetuate the myth of meritocracy, you know, um, saying that, you know, everything that this person has achieved is based on merit and not based on um, the privilege that this person may have by belonging to a particular demographic group. And finally, the fourth type of microaggressions are environmental. And these are when and environmental microaggressions are when insults and dismissals are reflected in the culture and climate of the workplace. So for example, the lack of diversity in medical schools and the medical curriculum can be an example, as well as the hallways that are decorated with pictures of white male physicians and having fewer female and underrepresented minority physicians in leadership positions. So now that we've further defined microaggressions for you, um, does anybody have any other examples of what they've observed or experienced in the past? And, and we'd also would also be interested in hearing if now you know a little bit more about what a microaggression might be, um, whether or not you might have perpetrated a microaggression, but whether or not you are someone that may be, oh, well, I've, I've done that before. So. Um, uh, this tends to be a pretty open group, so we want to spend a few minutes here, uh, and then after this we're going to hear from Lindy a little bit about some, some approaches to how you deal with microaggressions if you are involved. I think there are a number of, um, there are a couple of things in the chat, so I can go through them as well. So um, Dr. Milo was saying um, she, she would get, when will I see the doctor? Wow, you look too young. You look young for a doctor. 
um, which is something I've also heard. Um, Bill and Lindy, could you stop sharing and then we can see each other maybe? Oh. Sure. Yo, there are people. Okay, any comments? Uh, anyone have anything to share based on what you've heard and what your experiences might have been? I had one. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, is it Allie? Yeah, yeah it's Allie. Um, oh, I'll turn on my, my video doesn't want to turn on. Sorry. Um, I had one the other day and uh, I did not know how to deal with it. I wish I'd had a uh, quick little comeback or something I could say, but a colleague uh, and I were, um, we had a, um, a little bit of you know break in the action there was no patients to be seen at the moment for bed block or whatever and we were chatting and we were chatting about um, kind of what COVID has done to people and families and stuff uh, and the comment was made to me that um, how great this pandemic has been uh, because it meant children uh, we're finally able to spend the appropriate amount of time with their mothers and um, finally mothers had stopped farming out the raising of their children to preschools and schools. So how, how did that, how did that make you feel? What, 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 how did you want to respond to that? But, but you said you didn't. Oh, uh, if I had, I had been closer, I, 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 inside, I wanted to smack them. That's, that was my, uh, initial response, but um, you know, if if I had had my wits about me instead of being completely and utterly shocked, I think I would have just calmly asked them and challenged them as to why they think that's the case and why they think that's actually appropriate to say to a full time working mom who has a child in school um, who works their ass off to make sure that they're home as much as possible to help raise their child. Um, you know, I would ask how much they had been involved in raising their children as opposed to farming it out to society was how they had put it. Um, so I think I, if I'd had my wits about me, I could have had a very calm and respectful, uh, couple of challenging questions back. But in the moment, I just, I, I didn't know what to do or say. Okay, thanks, Ellie. I think that uh, Lindy's going to speak after this section on a little bit about about strategies to to think about for for next time. Um, any, anyone else have something, Dr. Dr. Lum? Pauly, there's a couple. Of, there are a number of um, comments from from the chat. If you, I don't yep. know if you can see it. Yeah, I had a question actually about the culture of of the emergency um, department. Uh, have you we? There are lots of great examples, and thank you very much, Lindy and Bill, for your um, content there. Are there any faculty to faculty or resident to faculty interactions um, that may be um, of interest to everybody? I know in the emergency room, uh, taking a step back, you see many consultants, um, you have lots of interactions, you're probably the highest per capita, per hour interactions. And, and I was just very curious to, to know, are there um, faculty to faculty, whether they're microaggressions or other uh, interactions, just as a question. And, and Bill, you this is your department and have you yourself observed any of that or Lindy? So uh, I think that yes, there are faculty to faculty, faculty resident, I think that, 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 that one of the things that's interesting, uh, and this isn't, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't call this a microaggression against any uh, type of minority, but uh, one of the things that we've often uh, struggled with in the emergency department uh, among faculty is that, that we get to where we are through two different educational streams. So there's the Royal College stream and the CCFP EM stream. And uh, there has always been, um, a difference or a perceived difference between those two. And I, I know a lot of our EM or two plus one colleagues have sometimes felt that they are treated uh, inferior to the Royal College people. And I think that sometimes comments are made by 
faculty uh, that might be rural college faculty that suggests that an individual or a group of EM faculty are less competent. And I think that those are examples of microaggressions where uh, someone is uh, making or insinuating comments that someone by virtue of their training or their background uh, might might not have uh, the same level of competence. So that that's something that just immediately jumps to my mind. I don't know if anyone else has any uh, examples that they might want to share. I'll just I've uh, been here for a little bit. Uh, so my name is Kang. I'm one of the uh, one of the um, one of the emerge uh, docs here. Um, I think this is what this is a personal, I, I guess, failure on my part. One of the residents came up to me. Uh, I'm based on uh, gender as well as racial identities. Thought that they were not getting as many um, recesses or procedures. Um, and my response to that was, you know, I think this is probably something that does happen in medicine. I, I certainly hope that whenever we work together that we don't have this thing kind of happen. But at that point, I didn't know how to support <clears throat> support them in any other way. So I was like, you know, I, th I think this is something you should discuss with your program director and your APD. Uh, and certainly I'm happy to chat about things further uh, and come up with um, coping strategies. But I didn't have a, I, I felt as if I was leaving them kind of um, empty handed a little because they, they came up, uh, brought up a real thing. And I was like, shoot, I I don't know what to do or say. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other examples that people have experienced uh, with respect to microaggressions or observed or maybe participated in? Hey, Bill, it's Munsef. Hey, Munsef. Um, so uh, IMGs, um, international medical graduates, um, often experience um, sort of a second class um, view from many of our colleagues and uh, I know this for sure because I'm often mistaken for an IMG um, and uh, many of our colleagues especially in my early years uh, would uh, ask me if I was Canadian trained or if I was an IMG um, and uh, sometimes it still happens um, but uh, um, corridor conversations certainly very recently um, I heard a conversation about a resident I was working with, their program director or um, one of their program people happened to pass by and then uh, say hi to this person. And then a few minutes later when they had uh, uh, um, moved away from where he was, say, yeah, that guy's an IMG. We probably should not have taken him. He doesn't know much about the system here. Uh, and I hope he doesn't uh, apply to a, um, an additional training program. And I kind of heard them say that uh, between each other. Um, the other thing, of course, is um, as people that gradually evolve into leadership roles, myself included, um, we sometimes become per perpetrators of uh, microaggression, maybe unknowingly, in exploring and responding to situations where there has been some act of unprofessional or at least seemingly unprofessional behavior or where there has been a complaint or a concern that has come up to us either as a program director or the site chief or whatever. And um, until and unless you are um, cognizant of some of our own biases and you know have gone through just culture training, sometimes the responses that we have, and I certainly have um, uh, examples of where I might have been guilty myself. Um, we certainly have to be aware of our own sort of uh, uh, biases. Um, and, and for me, certainly doing a lot of reading around this has been a huge uh, help to kind of phrase those conversations because we deal with behavioral, professional and clinical concerns all the time. Um, and so um, reading about implicit bias or, or reading about, you know, Malcolm Gladwell talking to strangers. I mean, these are things that I think should be mandatory for people who, you know, gradually climb up that ladder. I just wanted to share those two uh, little comments. Thanks, Thanks. Malcolm. I, I think that I think those are really insightful comments. And uh, part of what you're describing as a position, someone who's in a position of leadership is the role that we have as as bystanders. Now, as a leader, you're not a bystander, but um, you are uh, not directly involved. And the, the actions that we take um, uh, when we are confronted with those things 
um, uh, may may be uh, of great help or, or or may actually make things worse. So um, I think what I, what we'll do now is, is is hand it back over to Lindy to, to to just finish up talking about some approaches about what to do with these things, and then we'll come back to a group discussion where um, where more thoughts can come out and uh, about either microaggressions or the pro professionalism stuff in general. So let me just start sharing the screen again, and we'll turn it back to Lindy just for a few minutes and come back again. All right, so um, thank you for, for sharing all of your experiences. And I think the next part um, would transition well. So response, essentially, how do you respond to microaggressions in daily life? Um, now, the first thing you, you should do is, um, next slide, I recognize that they, that they do exist and identify strategies to counteract it, both as a bystander, as a recipient, or even as a source of microaggression. So as a recipient, you know, you might have a number of thoughts going through your head because, you know, you might just think to yourself, what does this person just say to me? Did they mean to insult me? Um, should I respond at all? Is, how should I respond if I choose to do so? Is it really worth it? And what would happen if I say something? Would there be any um, backlash or negative effects to me? And am I making a big deal about nothing? There are a number of themes that come that come up when in the literature um, as a recipient of micro of a microaggression, and that is number one, you can ask questions, ask clarifying questions to get the underlying intention, and you can come from a place of curiosity and not judgment. Um, a second part is explaining your thoughts and feelings about the interaction, and then number three, you can talk about the impact, um, the potential impact on other people that um, this a statement may have. Now there are a number of approaches in the, in the literature on how to deal with a microaggression as a recipient. And the first, um, first um, approach is the open the front door approach. And it is an acronym uh, for observe, think, feel, and desire. And it's, its first part is you observe. So say what exactly happened factually. Number two, uh, state your thoughts based on what's happened. Number three, talk about the emotions and feelings that you have based on what happened. And number four, you can talk about what you would like to happen in the future next time. Going back to case one, um, you know, as the, 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 as the physician who the patient confused you for as a nurse, um, one way to kind of approach this scenario through the open the front door approach would be to say, I noticed that you called me a nurse, even though I introduced myself as your doctor, just to state what happened. You know, get a sense of what they respond, what they say, and then say, I think that female physicians are often confused as nurses, and it can make me feel that perhaps you don't trust me as your doctor. So state your thoughts and feelings, and then you can say what you would like to have, what you would like to see in the future. So say, in the future, please feel free to ask me what my role is and I would be happy to reintroduce my role. Okay, another approach is called the action approach and it's very similar to the previous one, essentially asking clarifying questions, coming from a place of curiosity and not judgment, um, telling it exactly like what happened factually, exploring the impact on other people, um, discussing your thoughts and feelings about the situation and then talking about next steps. So going back to case two, where even though you were the senior resident, you were not, um, they didn't come to you for orders. You can approach the nurse afterwards and talk to her through the action approach. So you could say to the nurse, hey, I wonder why you were asking the male resident and not me for orders earlier. And then you can listen and see what they have to say. Um, then you can discuss, you know, what happened actually. You said, I saw that even though I was giving out orders, you didn't hear me and you ask the male junior for orders instead. And then you can talk about the effects. So I think that this can be a problem because the correct orders can be missed. I'm also frustrated that I'm not perceived as a leader. And then next time, please ask who the code leader is instead of assuming. 
Now the last approach is also very, is, is simpler. It's called the X, Y, Z approach. So stating, I feel X when you say Y because Z. Going back to the original case with the email that, um, that doesn't address you as a doctor, you can say to the originator, originator of that email, I feel undervalued when I was the only person who was not addressed as doctor in this email because it makes me feel excluded. So there are also a few things to things that you can do as a bystander, and that is something that Kang alluded to. So as a bystander, you can speak up and provide safe spaces. You can ask questions and gain perspective from of the recipient. You can advocate for the person behind closed doors and you can offer to be a mentor. And a really great example of this was when I was working in urgent care um, with my mentor when we were seeing a patient together. The patient said to me, wow, you look really young to be a doctor. And my mentor said, well, but she is a very good doctor. And I think that was a really good example of my mentor standing up for me. And finally, if you know, uh, if unintentionally you are the source of a microaggression, that is okay. Um, you can listen and seek feedback, be accountable and apologize, recognize the effect of your actions, even though regardless of what your intention, intention may be, educate yourself about privilege and use it as an opportunity to develop authentic relationships with your coworkers and trainees. And you can also commit to being better. Now, just a summary of my talk. Um, I think discussing microaggression and bias is a challenging topic, but I think it's important. Uh, microaggressions threaten communication, collaboration, and finally patient care. And I think addressing microaggressions, it helps us foster an inclusive work environment and it really ensures the best care of our patients. So, um, I would like to just um, thank everybody who's attended this talk and listened and provided your experiences. I would like to thank um, Dr. Foxcroft, um, my Grand Round Supervisor. She's had a lot of, she's helped me a lot in this presentation. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Jill Corney. She is an uh, anesthesia third year resident who presented a very similar topic to her department. And finally, I would like to um, thank Dr. McCauley for his part in this presentation. Um, and I just want to end the presentation with, you know, this quote by Maya Angelou. So I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, and then I just want to end this talk with the discussion, just open it up for a discussion and we can, um, and now we don't have any more, no more um, didactic elements to this presentation. We can open it up for, for what anybody else would have to say. Okay, thanks, Lindy. Um, oh, and um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Lum for, for being here in the in, in this presentation and contributing as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lindy. Um, uh, I think, uh, first, first of all, Lindy did a great job, I thought, of, of presenting these, these, uh, these concepts in a way that is understandable and relatable to all of us. So thank you, Lindy. Um, I wanted I wanted to highlight the uh, one aspect about the approach to microaggressions, and that's the concept of observations without judgment. So I think that making an observation on someone's behavior without judging them is, is an important way of feeding back that behavior, especially when you're when you tie that with the way it made you feel. And so, Ali, I'm glad you didn't smack your colleague, uh, but making an observation um, uh, about how it made you feel would have been perfectly reasonable. And it causes people to reflect for the next time. OK, so you can't take back what's already been said, but it causes people to reflect. So we just wanted to open it up now. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, this is a topic that often generates some discussion. So if people have thoughts or comments or questions or experiences they'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I'll, I'll maybe say it's Wanda. Um, all of the examples that you gave that were gender gender based, I think every woman in this group and probably every woman in medicine has experienced them all. And I have to say they've maybe even gotten worse since they've gotten bl turned blonde, uh, even continue to be uh, called a nurse uh, repeatedly every single day. So um, 
I'm not exactly sure that we have time to spend those extra two or three minutes having the, the XYZ or open the front door discussion with every patient. Um, but I think it's a really good place to start to, to actually think about those. I can imagine for visible minorities and people who, who dress differently or people who have an accent, that would be an added layer of, of an open opportunity. And opportunity is not the right word because for microaggressions against that group. Um, now on the flip side though, I'm struggling a little bit as, you know, as you meet a new colleague or you meet a new resident and you open the conversation is often, oh, where did you train? Now you're thinking, can I even ask that question? If my, if my new colleague or my new resident isn't white, is it going to be taken as a microaggression if I ask where you train when all I really meant is, you know, I trained at Calgary, you know, did you train at Ottawa? What was that like for you? So it almost makes, uh, causes sometimes the opposite effect in that you just don't say anything, which then is maybe also a microaggression because you're ignoring them. So I, I wonder if, if people have a comment on, on that perspective. Well, I, I think, Wanda, I think you've answered your own question. I think, I think you that the approach to that is to qualify the question with um, or, or to justify the question by with a statement. So saying, oh, I did my eMERGE training in Calgary or I did my medical school in Calgary. Where did you do your medical school? I think I think by by bringing yourself into it, I think uh, tends to, to take away from that perception of microaggression. But I'd, I'd like to hear if others have comments about that. I also think context matters, Wanda. Like if you met someone, a colleague for the first time or a learner, it, it's almost natural to ask where did you train where did you sort of come from before you were in London so um, maybe others have different uh, different opinions on that but I wouldn't take that as a necessarily a microaggression I think it would just be I would interpret that as like a natural uh, way of a co two colleagues meeting and a conversation evolving but I think the opposite if a patient were to randomly ask me or anybody um, even that you could argue it could go either way, but, uh, that, you know, so context would be totally different for that. I think that's a really good point, Corey, sorry, that's Justin Yan here, um, that the context really matters because I wonder myself sometimes when I've been the recipient of the microaggressions, if, if I really am being too sensitive, right? Like, I think, you know, Lindy had a, had a slide where we're, where it was suggesting, you know, maybe I'm making a big deal out of nothing. And there are, have been situations where certainly I've been the recipient of that microaggression, but there are times when it really is someone just making conversation. And I think for me, it's one of those things that I certainly struggle with as well as like, what, what am I, am, am I really reading way too much into this situation and playing that card? And it's because I have a chip on my shoulder. Um, the one thing that I would add is that, you know, it, 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 would it make a difference if the person asking me was of a visible minority or not, right? Like, would I interpret that differently? And, and that context is really important in that situation. Thanks, Justin. So I'll speak up because I'm a visible minority too. And it happens quite often on the uh, grocery line, particularly. Uh, when I was doing my fellowship in Nashville, we bought a mango. And back then this is like, you know, somebody commented on Bill McCauley's um, bio, I'm about the same vintage. So uh, having a mango was just a, a very new experience and somebody buying it was even more interesting. And so there was a comment and, and I just kindly explained to them the fruit and they were curious about where I came from. Um, actually, I was the one speaking without an accent because this was down in Nashville and, and, and others, I had difficulty understanding them. And so I curiously just asked them, you know, um, what is your background and what type of fruit do you like to eat? And so I think what you've heard from Bill is that it is the context. Um, what Wanda said, if you trained in Calgary and I trained in wherever, if you start with that bit of a preamble, that often also makes you vulnerable and, and opening up the doors. You're sharing something while you're curious about somebody else. Could I make a comment? Um, I wanna thank Lindy and Bill. I think your presentation was great. And just to shift focus, there's a lot that could be said with the theme we're on. 
but I really appreciated your comments about the focus on, on wellness and health for us as individuals in order to, to go out. And it, traditionally that's not been, it's always patient-centered care, which is very important. But I really like your emphasis on recognizing the personal factors that come to our work interactions and the personal responsibility we have to pay attention to those cues. Because I, like you, Bill, think that people are basically wanting to do the right thing for their patients, for their teams. And if we can um, focus on, on it's okay to say, I need a break, or I need, I need to do something to refresh myself, or to whatever it is, that's not a weakness, that's a strength. And we need to, we need to pay more attention to that. Because I think some of the lapses occur when there's just too much colliding and it's traditionally been um, a weakness to sort of admit that I'm, I'm not got it all together today. So I, I really wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, Kelly. I think that um, uh, I, I agree with you. I think that we need to bring back a focus to our own wellness and to um, looking after each other. And, and that, that um, that focus you may, at least I hope, have seen through the actions of the of the uh, Office of Clinical Faculty Affairs, where we put together a, a well-being program that is robust and working well, where we're, where our approach to professionalism lapses is is focusing on individuals' wellness, and I think with respect to microaggressions, uh, looking after each other is really important as bystanders because um, I mean I as a as a as a white wasp male. Uh, other than Gory laughing at the year of my graduation, haven't been a victim of microaggressions, uh, but I've certainly been been a, a bystander, been an observer, and um, uh, and more often than not, probably have not spoken up. And so, looking after each other, our colleagues and our and our our, our colleagues in training, uh, looking after each other by standing up for them uh, when you observe microaggressions, I think will go a long way to to bring some some cohesiveness to the group. And it's a pretty cohesive group to begin with. Um, can I just make a comment? Sure. It's Ali again. Um, I think the other thing that's really important um, is, well, a couple of things. Uh, one is to remember that there are some groups that will be hit harder simply because of intersectionality. So for example, uh, as a, a white female, I'm gonna have a harder time with some things than a white male but a uh, person of color that is female is gonna even have a harder time than me and then a doubly harder time than a white male, for example. So there are some people out there that are gonna get double and triple hits um, and, that, and that makes um, kind of solving, it's not the right uh, word, but addressing it appropriately a little bit more difficult. Um, so just to keep in mind that some people will uh, have a harder time than others. Um, and I think the other really important thing is uh, that the default has to be to believe the person who's experiencing it. So if a person says they are experiencing something and it's making them feel this way, the default has to be that they are indeed experiencing this. It can't be, well, no, that's not happening or no, I know this person and they would never do that or no, it's not meant to be that way. Um, you have to remember that uh, intent is not even close to impact. Um, so the default has to be to believe these people and to uh, provide support in any way we can, regardless of our thoughts towards the other side. Thanks, Ali. I think that's a, that's a, a great uh, way to summarize things. And um, uh, I, I do think that, that um, Experiences like this, where at least we're talking about it and causing each other to cause, causing ourselves to reflect on it, I think that really helps us to think about things in the moment a little bit more. Um, I, I think, Gory, it's probably time for us to wrap this up. We're right at ten o'clock, and I know I want to be respectful of people's time, so um, maybe I'll just take the opportunity to thank everyone for participating. Um, uh, we are all available uh, to be contacted if you want to talk about this more. Um, if you feel uh, you need some well-being support, then uh, you can contact Wanda, you can contact uh, myself or Dr. Lum. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for your willingness to engage and think about uh, a topic that's not 
not quite traditional for our emergency medicine grand rounds, but uh, probably as more or more important than many of the, the, the heavily science-based topics that we often hear about. So thanks everyone for, for, for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Lindy.